in the journey of reconciliation with these people. The Niitsi Tape, the Absoluke, the Cheyenne, the Ochote, Shokowin. We give thanks to the Creator and to those people who have stewarded this land for generations. We are grateful for the opportunity to live, to work, and to worship here. Good Christian friends, rejoice! Jesus Christ was born to save. He has opened heaven's door and we are blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for us. able and join in our call to worship. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. The Lord has done marvelous things. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the hills sing together for joy, for the Lord is with us. Make a joyful noise. Thanks be to God. Friends, we come to that time where we greet one another in the name of Christ, and unlike a Sunday morning, let's uh, just turn to our neighbors and do so. <laughs> Thank you. 
The season for watching and waiting is over. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. This is the light of the world, and the darkness cannot extinguish it. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare God's glory among the nations. God's marvelous works among all the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due. Bring an offering and come into the holy courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before God all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. God will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with truth. I invite our children to come forward this evening. So I need your guys' help this evening. I need you to help me open this gift. OK, you want to do it? All right. What? He's too vicious? <laughs> I want to know what a vicious present opener looks like. Hi, Chelsea. Yeah? All right. What is this? A chocolate orange. Have you ever had a chocolate orange? I've been given one at school. You didn't eat it either? I don't want this. Do you want this? I don't want this. <laughs> have you guys ever? You do? You can have it. Have you ever got a gift from somebody you didn't want? <laughs> no? I'm the only one? No. Well, somebody gave me that gift the other day, and when it sat on my desk, I thought, yuck. I don't want that. Luckily, I can just take it to the Pinochle group, and they'll eat it. But as I sat there, and the person who gave it gave it to me, I said, oh, what an unusual gift. 
And she said to me, every year for Christmas, my mom would give me a chocolate orange. And my mom's no longer with us, and so I give chocolate oranges to remember my mom. And do you know how that made me feel? <laughs> Not very good, right? Because somebody had given me a gift, and although I didn't like it, it meant a lot to them. And so when you're opening presents, maybe tonight or tomorrow or any time in life that you get a gift from somebody, I want you to remember that the gift always has a special meaning, whether it's something that you want or not. And tonight we celebrate the greatest gift of all time, a box. <laughs> Close, but no. Can't even use the phrase. What's the greatest gift? Well, who are we celebrating tonight? Jesus. You knew that. Yeah, that's the greatest gift of all. Yeah? All right, will you guys pray with me? All right. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for coming to earth and showing your light. Help us to be a light in this dark world. Amen. All right, you can take two as long as you give one away. Okay, you can give one to your mom. Do you want to give one to your dad too? Do you want to give one to grandma before she goes sit back down? You see her up there? Our first scripture reading this evening comes from Titus, chapter 2, starting in the 11th verse. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all inequity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. He is. Let us go to God in prayer. God of glory, by your grace a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests on his shoulders, and in his name we pray. Wonderful counselor, we pray for wisdom for the world's leaders that they may use their power to lift burdens and break the bonds of oppression. Mighty God, we pray for the Church of Jesus Christ our Lord, that you will multiply and increase our joy as we share in the harvest 
you have gathered. Creator of all, we pray for families, friends, and loved ones, that those who now walk in deep darkness may see the great light of your saving love. Prince of Peace, we pray for an end to violence and warfare, especially in Ukraine, that your authority may continue to grow until there is endless peace in every land. Lord of hosts, establish your holy realm with justice and righteousness from this time on and forevermore. comes from Luke 2 verses 1 through 20. In those days a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. 
When they saw this, they made known what they had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. the time where Advent is finally over. The waiting and the anticipation. And in this church, over the course of the last couple of weeks, we've been journeying through what it is we're supposed to learn from this season. We started by connecting Mary to Miriam. Miriam being the sister of Moses, the one that makes sure that he is taken care of once Pharaoh's daughter finds him in the water. And we are reminded that the two of them, connected by name and not by name alone, would choose to lead with song instead of sword. That they would hear the call of God and respond, not in fear, but rejoicing. We talked about Joseph and how Joseph, this character, is connected to Joseph in the Hebrew Bible. The both dream dreams, both end up in Egypt, and both do everything within their power to protect their families. We've talked about how there are different versions of the story, and how that having different versions of the story doesn't make any one of them any less true, maybe inaccurate in a modern day sense, but that we understand that scripture, <coughs> we have four gospels and they don't match either, is often told in different ways in multiple versions to help us better understand the theological lessons they have to teach. So let's think about this night. Let's note that one of the things that we often try to work sermons around or wonder about is why there was no room at the inn. Now, pastors conveniently use this text to make different, re or different re lessons for different reasons. One of the first that sometimes we hear is, they were just so poor they couldn't afford it. Right, and every pastor loves that story because we should be doing more for people who are insecure and housing and housed in our communities. And that's true, but probably not true of Mary and Joseph. Some scholars suggest that Joseph's family, the land that they would have been traveling to because it was his family and that was where the census needed to be taken, didn't accept Mary and being pregnant before they were wed. I can imagine certain pastors really like to teach about that on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Deciding who's in and who's out of the family based on choices. <laughs> Not me. Some scholars even suggest that perhaps the innkeeper decided that because Mary needed to give birth that she would have made the entire inn impure, thus making all of the patrons impure. And so they decided to cast them away. Perhaps a preamble to the way that Jesus will come in and talk about the law and how sometimes we need to pay attention to the spirit of the law instead of the letter of the law. But our scholar and author who's been guiding us through this says, this is BS. All poor excuses for why this happened. Amy Jill Levine says, this scene has nothing to do with either poverty or purity. Luke simply states, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. 
and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. The point is, there was no room. That is, no place for them at the inn. For Mary was about to give birth. Inns were a very public space. Mary needed privacy. There was no room. I think this is a good reminder for us as we've been pulling apart the different texts and trying to decide what it is we should glean from them that we are Wesleyan and so oftentimes in our Wesleyan understanding we live in a both and frame. We've talked a lot about this recently. That when two stories or two theological understandings are pinned against each other we as Wesleyans can look at them and say but it can be both and. We are to dive deep into the text and find the deeper meaning behind these stories. And sometimes we are just supposed to acknowledge that perhaps it's as clear as day, there is no room. But as I sit and I look at this text, I am reminded of the words we read from Amy Jill earlier this year. They noted that Jesus wasn't just born in a manger. And a manger isn't just a bed of straw, but it is the feeding trough. That is to say that Jesus comes to us as the food of life, the bread sent from heaven to nourish our souls. Luke here is anticipating the communion story. And just like the Hebrew texts tell us that King Solomon was nurtured by snug clothes and good care, our Lord enters the world in the same way every other human does. And guess what? He will die in the same way every other human does. Because we get the gift of a God that is fully human and fully divine. Last year I started my sermon on Christmas Eve by acknowledging that it had been a pretty crappy year. I was reminded the other night when I was talking to Judy on the phone. (laughs) My mom will also be calling me to remind me that she doesn't think I should say crap in church. (laughs) (laughs) Hashtag pastor fail. (laughs) But I don't know about you, I, I talked with so many of my other clergy friends about how last year it was like we were coming out of the pandemic and that this year was gonna look so different. And it didn't. We started our year thinking about the horrendous acts of violence in Ukraine and Russia. We continue to hear those stories. We've seen upheaval in our country. Gun violence continues to grow. We look at the people and the needs of the people in our communities. People, refugees fleeing from their homelands, searching for safety. And yet I don't know if it's just me personally or collectively. It doesn't seem like we've quite been able to take a breath. And then we see courageous moments of leadership when the prime minister of Ukraine stands in our house of government. Somebody leading with truth and honesty and compassion. And I'm reminded how oftentimes the news sucks me into that dark, deep place. But we don't celebrate the beautiful spaces that we see around us every day where light bursts forth. Tonight, I am reminded that our God comes to us in a fragile state of a manger, and it's in the fragile things that we have to remind ourselves that we have to handle them with care. And sometimes, handling them with care is just being aware of what's happening around us. The fragile state of the manger reminds us and calls us to true authenticity and honesty about the state of our own lives. We need a savior who emerges in a fragile state because we are fragile and our world is fragile. So what do we do with this story? We read the same story every year. We all get our feel goods on by lighting our candles. Everything's good. We're all stressed out about what we have to do when we get home and what tomorrow is going to look like. But how does it call us to return to our all-loving God and remind us that we are children of a compassionate God who will never turn away from us. His own child is born in the barn. 
Then I read this text from Titus. Titus doesn't get much mention in the lectionary. As a matter of fact, he gets Christmas Eve and we always skip him. <laughs> and then he gets Christmas Day and none of us do Christmas on Christmas Day, especially Methodists. <laughs> Hear these words again. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety, worldly passions, and in present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all inequity and purify for himself a people of his own, who are zealous for good deeds. The reading reminds us that salvation being announced has direct and immediate implication for our lives. It is not just about coming to church and listening to the pretty songs. It is something that should alter the way we live. For those of us that have been harmed by the church, this text has often been used in a way of saying that your lifestyle is corrupted by the world. Something I've heard many a times from kind-hearted Christians who I believe are just simply misled. David Rinsberg reminds us that this pastoral letter offers a sobering example for churches enmeshed in modern and postmodern cultures today. How can we renounce worldly passions, including the passions of security, power, and dominance, while still interacting with a culture that is devoted to those things? The goal of God's grace is to bring salvation to all, and it is the church's responsibility somehow to let all know about the manifestation of this grace. In the coming of Christ, without falling into fatal compromises in the process. I believe that the message of salvation is this reminder that both in word and do deed, we can do better. In recalling the bestseller, The Kite Runner, David Wood recalls us, or calls us to remember the line that is so important in this book. There is a way to be good again. The main character of the book, Amir, betrays his best friend, Hassan, in a way that leads to tragedy and suffering, and he lives with this for the rest of his life. Upon receiving a note in the mail, he begins the sacrificial journey to save Hassan's son after Hassan and his wife had been murdered. This phrase, there is a way to be good again. Taps into the deep yearning we have to do and be better than we are. All that sorrow, grief, and shame, and sin is not out of view this night. It all belongs here. It finds a place amid the candlelight. Amid all the talk of cattle lowing, babies waking, stars shining, and shepherds watching, our lives are called out from the shadows and into the light of this night. So be gentle with yourselves this season. And in the seasons to come, we're all going to mess up sinners that we are, but we are also able to accomplish amazing things in the spirit of the love of our God and our neighbor because we can simply remind each other to do better. There is a way to be good again. M. Sean Copeland, a black feminist Catholic, wrote this amazing text about having zeal zealous behavior towards God. Learning when and how, to what and to whom, to give our yes or our no is a lifelong project. It is learning to live not merely in dull balance or tedious moderation, but in passionate, disciplined choice and action. It is learning to find support and challenge, courage and correction as we live out our choices.
Sustaining and realizing our yes from day to day is only possible when negative and destructive behaviors are supplanted by positive and generative ones. When we redeem the routines of our daily lives, when we choose and carry out commitments that give and support life. Titus gets a bad rap for telling us that we should get it together. And unfortunately, conservative Christians have taken that text and made us all feel horrible about ourselves. But the truth is that as we receive the gift, the manifestation of God in our lives today, we are called to look at our daily routines, to make the commitment to give and to support life. Whatever you do, do it with zeal for good deeds. And know that you won't always get it right. I don't get it right. The church definitely doesn't get it right. But we hold close to the stories that ground us and remind us of the choices made by those in the past to sustain us for the journey ahead. Like Mary, the young virgin who was told that she would give birth to a child who responds with the Magnificat. Like Joseph, whose betrothed becomes pregnant, not by him, but he chooses to protect her, to care for her, to take her to Egypt. And the example of a little child who will save the world of sin and death. Thanks be to God.
Friends, we come to that time of our service where we remember the gifts, talents, times, and abilities, the resources that we give back in the name of the one who created us. Uh, tonight's probably one of the first times I've sweat in the pulpit because I jacked the heat up really high before Leanne got in. <laughs> Some of you know we have a little war about the temperature in the sanctuary. But unfortunately, it costs money to keep that heat on. So we invite you to give in the offering plate in the back also. Um, but in all honesty, my friends, it is about the ways that we give of our hearts during this season. And so as we enter into this time of singing the Lord's Prayer, um, I invite you just to join with us and sing in response. Following that, I'll do a short liturgy, and then uh, Gary will be in the back. I'll start at the front. We'll light our candles. We'll sing Silent Night together. And then after the benediction, we're going to head outside and sing Joy to the World with our candles still lit. Um, and so you might want to coat up beforehand if that is appropriate. Um, but let us go to God in prayer. We have heard the call to watch, but we are keeping, what are we keeping watch over? Maybe we're looking for something that will define us, something that will remake us, transform us, some relationship, some hope, some love that will make us new. Maybe we're looking for the gift we remember this night. O oh, holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born to us this day. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Let us light these candles as we rejoice in the light that shines in the darkness and declare with joy and with hope, joy to the world. The Lord has come. Hallelujah.
Let us stand as we hear this benediction and blessing. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoners, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people, to make music in the heart. Receive now this blessing in the name of our Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us go outside and sing joy to the world. Amen.